All right, Vinny, thank you for joining the Challenger podcast. It's great to have you on. Cool. Well, great, Brady. Thank you. Uh, two Italians on, on a call at one time is uh, probably going to scare people, but uh, it'll be fine. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So we were just talking about, um, you know, what your specific superpower is in, in, in the industry. What does it mean to like have a superpower? And I mean, I, I asked you a funny question that kind of prompted that, that answer, but how, when did you start thinking about a superpower and, and how you got yours? Well, I, I never really thought about it. it. You know, it's just one of those things that, that evolves over time. And, and you know, you, you know, people think, well, I got I to gotta hone this skill or hone that skill or, or, or find this or that. And I think with me, it, it just happened kind of organically. And, and, and as I said, you know, I was at a, I was in an event in, uh, in Southern California. And, and probably the, for the folks who are watching, you know, my name is Vinny Catalano. I'm a employee benefits uh, consultant with, uh, with Lockton. And uh, I'm out of Northern California, but uh, you know I work uh, throughout the West Western region, actually throughout the country, if uh, the relationships are there. And so uh, that's what I do for a, for for a living. But you know I was at an insurance event um, a couple of years ago in Southern California, and senior leader at one of these uh, one, one of the major insurers in California, you know, came up to me and just I don't know if they were they were joking, but I think they were saying, "Well, what's your superpower?" And I'm like, thought about it for a split second, and I go, "Well, you know, I'm a New Yorker." Right. And, and my, my, my father always, uh, always said, it's, it's always good to know a guy. And that's, that really is my superpower. I, I do know a guy or a gal, uh, uh, you know, um, and it's, it's always, it's always good to, to be able to, to use long-term relationships to help benefit your clients. Um, and any, anybody who needs something done, I mean, um, I was just giving you the example of, of an employee working for one of my clients who I, I get an email from the, you know, HR leader on Sunday night, you know, this person, the, the employee was in Mexico, was injured, severely hurt their back and, and they may, may be broken. And, um, you know, what are we going to do with this guy? How do we engage with their insurer <clears throat> to help get them back to the U.S. in a proper care, you know, situation? And, um, you know, once she, I, see, I live for that stuff. I live for helping people in complex situations. And so long story short, uh, within 12 hours, you know, the company was engaged with the care team in Mexico. Um, I can't even, as, as I sit here, I can't even tell you what the out, final outcome is going to be because they're still figuring out the air ambulance. But I mean, that person is going to get back to the U.S. Uh, somehow and they're going to be well taken care of. And that's because myself and my team within Lockton was able to jump in with the relationship I had with the insurer to help fix this guy's problem. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's the stuff I live for in this business, you know? And that's like one of those really specific things that you were able to add value to at Lockton. Have, is it very often that you find yourself in these super nuanced situations where it's really only you or one or two other people who can pull the strings to make it happen? Well, that's a, that's a really good question because, you know, when I look at doing what I do for a living, uh, and that is, you know, advising clients on their employee benefits, and, and, and that is a, a thing that has certainly evolved a lot over the last several years. Uh, you know, back in the day, you know, a broker or a consultant would, would sit down with a client and the main part of the conversation was, you know, talking about rates and plans. Now, rates and plans are interesting. But, but now we're talking about employee engagement. We're talking about communications. We're talking about, you know, return to work or back to work. We're talking about, um, you know, well-being in all its forms. We're talking about um, technology and how to implement it well for their employees. We're talking about financial wellness. We're talking about all these things. And it's not a simple job anymore. And, and so, you know, when, when people are out um, saying, well, you know, I, I've been working with my, my consultant or broker for, for a long time, you know, I, I, we're not going to talk to you this year. You know, at the end of the day, I have to find unique ways to differentiate myself. And so, you know, it's all about nuance. It's all about working at the, uh, at finding at the margin, given specific areas that I can improve upon what they're doing today or the thought process. I think, I think the important thing is challenging the client to think differently. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's that's really important. That that's another superpower is how do you really engage with that client and and make them better. You know, I think that's important. You know, absolutely help them think about things differently, and in turn, that helps their employees in in ways that they probably have never even expected to do so. 
Well, exa exactly right. And, and there's so much product out on the marketplace. I mean, you, you reached out to me on LinkedIn. And, you know, over this COVID period, which has been very interesting, I get reached out to, I don't know, I mean, let's just say I'm, be, I'm trying to be sold to more than ever before. Mm -hmm. um, and I have stopped almost accepting certain requests because I know the second I say yes or, or, or accept the invite, mm -hmm. someone's trying to sell me something. Yeah. And, I, and I don't like that style or approach, right? But there are specific people that have reached out to me in the last six, eight months where I've taken those calls and I've learned something new about the industry or learned something new about the marketplace or learned about a new point solution and I've got one that I'm working on right now, which I don't, I don't want to name on, on, on camera, but yeah. it is slick as hell. And it's, it's something where people will be able to take better control over the cost of their or of, of, of healthcare for the enterprise. And so I'm really excited about, about stuff like mm -hmm. that. You know, That's awesome. Yeah. It might be interesting to learn. Yeah. How do you prefer to be in, I guess maybe even you don't want this information out there because it would tell people how you like to be sold to, but like, how, how do these people usually get in touch with you if it isn't over like LinkedIn message or anything? Well, they, 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 they try to just, they just send you a, um, you know, they, they send you a, a LinkedIn connection request. And, you know, I mean, and, and so, and so it's so funny to me because it's like, you know, everybody's it looks like they've all gone to the same school of LinkedIn communication. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's, it's like they're using the same verbiage and all this. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, we're in the same industry, we're in the same this, okay, I, oh yeah, I'm building my network, it's like, okay, great, now then I take a look at what they do and who they are, and, and I'm like, well, I, I don't need new friends for the sake of new friends, I mean, is there some way we can mutually, you know, have a beneficial relationship, and, and I think if, as long as they're authentic, you know, if they reach out to me at a level of, with a level of authenticity that I can feel, right, then I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm all in, you know, but just don't don't be phony with me. Don't none of that. I mean, I, and I'm I'm a sales guy, right? I mean, you know, you, I'm, yeah. you know, the best person you could sell to is a sales guy. But even I hate salespeople, it, you know, it, to some degree. So so it's just it's just a matter of how you you choose to engage professionally with someone. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think there's something that's always and always will be sort of cringy about the sort of like cookie cutter um, salesman kind of tactics. And then with LinkedIn, it's kind of blown out of proportion because you can be reaching out to people so many yeah. people and get so many messages i mean it's like well you know and, and to be honest i've started using linkedin a little more um in terms of building bridges with with new new people um because you know look at it right LinkedIn. i was thinking about this just yesterday you know linkedin there's no alternate to linkedin hmm. i mean there's no other platform that's a true b2b thing i mean on the social, regular social side, I mean, you got, you know, between Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and whatever else, you, you, you've got a number of platforms that people, you know, can relate on. The business, I mean, unless you're using something internally like Slack or whatever, I mean, that's different, but I mean, you know, it's, 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 LinkedIn is like it. <laughs> yeah. So, and everybody's on it, and everybody's on it. Everybody, it, it's, it's, people are more active in it, and it's a comfort zone for people, I think, too. Mm -hmm. I think I think you just hit on the new meta sales tactic, which is selling through TikTok. <laughs> I, I think I think that's it. Dance, you know, it's okay. Dance videos, yeah. Here's our yeah, value dance add. Videos here's our product. About employee benefits, you know. Yes, that's funny. That's good. On on the topic of some of those, you know, benefits that you're starting to think about that are becoming more and more relevant yeah. in the COVID world. What are I guess just some of the areas that you're most excited about? Well, I, I, I think that um, one of the areas that I, I feel that is coming of age, getting there is really two things. One is, is well-being and, and what that means to an enterprise and, and an employer. What, what does it mean to, to be engaged with your employees in a well-being program? Um, and so that is a huge challenge for any, any organization. And I think the vendors of said products are getting better at it. Uh, in fact, this afternoon, I've got a, a two o'clock, I've got a, um, 
uh, a meeting like this with uh, one of the major players in that space that reached out to me on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm, I'm really, really excited about that. So, so there, there's, there's that. This, the second thing I think is really, you know, how do organizations use data to improve what they're doing? And um, that has to do with, with the cost of care, the cost of insurance, um, all those kind of things, and, and how, how can they access data and use it well? I mean, it's one thing to, to look at a list of high cost claimants that are working for you, and, and you know, this one had cancer, and this one had a back problem, and this one had a bypass, and all these different things, right? Um, but, but now what are you gonna do with that data? You know, how, how do you do it? And so there's that. And then as a corollary to that, one of the things I have a, uh, another company I'm working with that has a way of now incentivizing employees to go, to go to doctors that are within their health plan who are the top rated doctors. Because the top rated doctors, which may be counterintuitive, the top rated doctors actually have better outcomes and cost you less in the long run than just going to whatever random surgeon or physician, depending upon the, the care modality that that's necessary. So if I can incentivize an employee to go to a top doc to treat X, Y, or Z, um, and I can lower the overall cost of, of care, that's a win for the organization. And so those, those are just a couple of things that I find that that will be growing on trend here in the next uh, couple of couple of years. I, it's funny I use that word on trend. My, my wife is an interior designer and um, she happens to be the board of directors chair for the National of the American Society of Interior Designers. And so she's kind of a gamer and, and she's everybody's always interviewing her about trends in the design industry. Um, and so I'm, I'm now being more mindful of trends in the benefit industry. I mean, to, to what you were talking, we were talking earlier about is financial wellness. Um, financial wellness is, is a huge challenge for people. You know, how do I get people to save? How do I get people to do, you know, whatever it is I, I, I need them to do, um, to, 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 you know, to make money and, and to do well, you know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think that's that. That's a that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. It is. You, smart data is becoming increasingly important, and maybe that's just a part of the trend. Um, yeah, I think I think trend definitely applies. You know, as it does in interior decoration as well with with benefits. Um, that's a funny you know way to put it. Well, well, it really it really does because I mean things change. And like, like you and I when we start, when we first started chatting uh, this morning, looking at the role of HR. You know, the role of HR is if there's ever been the year that HR has been forced to evolve, it's 2020. I mean, and, you know, during COVID, they're evolving while they're working from home. They're trying to figure out how, first of all, they figured out how to get their employees to work from home, if that was possible. Now, I was on a webinar this morning about, you know, now how do we get them back? And, and what have been the challenges of getting employees back to work? So there's, there's that, um, you know, there's, there's social equity, the Black Lives Matter movement, everything that they have to now be responsible for internally. And now we've layered these three very thick pieces of layer cake on top of an already thick layer cake of, you know, compliance and recruitment and retention and benefits and, you know, any number of, of challenges, workplace investigations, you know, any number of challenges in the workplace. And so, you know, HR, you know, I salute you. I mean, you are the, the you know, over, most overworked, underpaid folks in, in, in the biz. And I, the people I've talked to this year certainly have risen to the occasion. They're, they're, mm -hmm. they're doing what they can to adapt to this. I'm always blown away by when I talk to HR managers or CHROs, they are, I mean, so in tune with their employees and they know absolutely every initiative that they have going on and, and how it's going to impact the organization and, you know, when it will be launched, like all these things are so complicated and they've really pivoted on a dime, I feel like, just in the past yeah. few months. 
Yeah, so uh, on Friday, this coming Friday, the Cal California Chamber of Commerce is doing a um, uh, their, their annual HR symposium. That's right, and you're um, speaking at that, right? Right, I'm speaking at it, and um, um, the topic that, that I have along with uh, uh, my speaking partner is, is, you know, in the midst of all this, you know, truly, how do we get HR people to the table? Meaning that, you know, HR is this great function but it always tends to be adjunct to the C-suite, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and in, in certain large organizations that that elevation has been to, you know, chief human resources officer. So there is a C in front, but in many organizations, especially in the mid market and smaller, it's not like that. And so uh, I think the key challenge and what we're talking about uh, in our session is number one, how to, you know, what can HR people do to, to, to get that, get to the table better. And then my section, even though it sounds absolutely horrific, it's all about finance of health plans, okay? Mm -hmm. If most HR people aren't well-trained formally in how to talk benefit speak to their CFO. And so um, they take the information their broker gives them, they absorb it, and now they're sitting with the CFO. And, and, and in years when you know, renewals are modest, it's all good, you know, three, four percent, whatever it might be. But lo and behold, when you get a double digit renewal, who someone has to get fired. Who's getting fired? Is it the broker? Is the insurer? I mean, so something has to happen because the CFO or the CEO gets involved. And I was just reading a, a study from the International Benefits Institute about how CFOs are getting more and more involved in the benefits conversation. So I think it's important for you know HR people to have the, the toolbox to be able to talk to the financial people in their organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there can be some sort of loss as, as soon as the, the HR people, the CHROs are, you know, they're the ones who are most in tune with the benefits and the employees that they'll be providing the benefits to. And then as soon as they bring it to the C CEO or CFO, there might be some loss there. So being able to communicate mm -hmm. it as well as possible is important. No, for sure. There's definitely there's definitely some loss in the conversation. I always, I always joke, and I'm sure it's trademarked, but uh, I mean, it's like, you know, HR, HR people are from Venus and CFOs are from Mars, okay? And I, I've watched these conversations in, in conference rooms where they are looking at two sides, opposite sides of the same problem. And sometimes they're just talking past each other. And, you know, where the HR folks are, are definitely um, empathetic and interested in, in the employee experience and, and, and and, and cost for sure, um, but the CFO is more interested in, in, in on the financial you know side of, of the equation, and right. um, um, and, and it, it takes time to build that that common language, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd be good to hit on this a little bit because this is what we focus on at Challengers: financial wellness. I mean, I'd love to hear what are some of the whether there are initiatives that you've seen in the past that you've been excited about or even just any broad thoughts on, on financial wellness. It'd be great to hear. Well, it's, a, it's a huge problem. I, I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, when, as we've seen in the, in the news in the last year, I mean, how many people, you know, who've lost their jobs and, and are now not getting a, a, you know, a government assistance check ha have no safety net. They, they have no money in the bank. They haven't planned for three months or six months worth of expenses, you know, I mean, what's the data about the, the, the high percentage of people who, who don't have 400 bucks to, to pick up uh, an unexpected expense? I mean, I mean that, that's, that's horrific, you know? And, and so I think organizations struggle with the notion of financial wellness. I mean, number one, how do we give people a path to retirement? Um, but now it's not even retirement. It's how do I give people a path to next week, <laughs> you right. know, and, and, right. and, and train them. And as you and I touched on earlier, I mean, people aren't, you know, given, you don't go to school in high school or college and take that financial, you know, training class, you know, you go out into the world and you learn it on the fly. And, and I think that's where businesses are realizing that, you know, this notion of, and this came up years ago in the conversation around well-being. I mean, there's absenteeism when people aren't showing up and there's presenteeism when people are, you know, the lights are on, but nobody's home. I mean, they come to work right. and they're not being a productive employee. And so who are the, who are the, the presenteeism folks? Well, those are the people who have active health issues, okay, or active financial trouble. I mean, or obviously have other family issues too going on. Mm -hmm. But 
Um, the financial side of that is a huge, a huge challenge. Um, you know, and I don't know that anybody in the marketplace is doing anything that innovative. I, I mean, I, I look at, you know, I look at consumer directed health plans, which are supposed to change the face of, you know, health, health insurance, you know, when they were launched in 2006, um, 14 years later, I'm still waiting, you know, for the, for the, for that. I mean, there's nothing that's, if anything, you know, deductibles have gone higher and out of pocket max has gotten higher and organizations are actually beginning. I'm, I'm seeing the data to pull back from those kind of plan structures mm -hmm. And, and go back to more traditional plan structures of just regular co-pays to pay for services. Um, so I, I don't know that I'm, I'm excited about a whole lot in, in that market in the finance. I mean, companies are doing some financial education. I mean, you and I talked about a vendor that is going out and, and, and trying to contract with, with employers to bring advisors into um, the conversation. Mm -hmm and literally have classrooms full of people that they are training and it's a, they have a very, very specific and very good curriculum. Um, that, that, that's certainly a step in the right direction, but mm -hmm. it's not, you know, it's not really great, a huge, I don't know what the impact is going to be for something like that. So. Right. Right. I think that's really the role that we're trying to fill of an actual innovative tool that can help employees in a substantive way. You know, having a call line available is fine. Having a seminar is fine for your employees. Um, but realistically, you can probably just bake all of those things into a software product. And if that software product is also the source of funds, and you can help people you yeah. know, budget and save that way right at the source, um, that might be a good way to accomplish that goal. Uh, but yeah, no, thank you for, for sharing those. those no, thoughts. no, for sure. And, and listen, you know, obviously, you know, you and I are two different generations. Um, but, you know, generationally, people in that millennial and, and, and Gen Z, you know, they, you know, your lens is different from my lens, right? Um, in terms of you know when you, you know, how how people who are in their twenties and thirties kind of were, were were raised in the financial crisis and I mean different things in you know, the early the you know mid two thousands and other times and 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 I see a high level of interest in younger people about saving money and planning for their future and, and buying a home. I'm, I'm, I'm finding it fascinating the trends now going on with, you know, young people in the tech business who are getting the heck out of San Francisco and Silicon Valley and moving to places like where I live in Sacramento. I mean, the cost of living here is maybe half, you know, 40% the cost. I mean, a young couple move in next door. They're both about 30, 32. He works in tech. She's a young physician. You know, this is, they bought a house next door. I mean, they, they couldn't be happier, you know? And we're seeing younger people make, move, you know, literally take their wallets and say, I'm going to a place where I can afford to live more effectively or more yeah. cost effectively. So. This is another very noteworthy trend to come back to that theme of people are leaving. The COVID world has changed a lot of things. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we just have to accept it. You know, it, it is what it is. And, and, um, you know, as we sit here on election day, you know, I mean, who knows what happens, you know, at the end of the day, and this is the only thing, and maybe in closing, because I've got, I've got to run on to my yes. next thing here. In, in closing, the way I look at it is, you know, I, I'm of an age where I've, I think I calculated I've lived through a lot of presidential elections, and hopefully I'll live through a whole bunch more. At, at the end of the day, every presidential election has been, you know, the most important election of a lifetime. And everybody... You know, at the end of the day, you know, live your life, do your best, right? That's all I can say about that. That's it. Those are some good closing thoughts right there. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> well, I want to be mindful of your time. Vinny, thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you for joining. Excellent, Brian. Well, listen, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with uh, you and your audience, and um, we'll stay in touch.